thanks for coming and uh, checking this out. And also thank you to everyone who is here and participating in this panel about uh, engagement. We'll try to cover a lot of different things as much as we can in these 30 minutes. And we have a really cool panel lined up. And I would like to get started by everyone just quickly introducing themselves. Like maybe just give us a quick info who you are, what you do here, and like what your company does. Yep, I'll start. Start so <laughs> my name is Alex Austin. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Branch. Um, my, what I do there, uh, I'm an engineer by background and preference, and I uh, now do a lot more people stuff, but I still try to be involved in the code and the product as much as I can. Um, what does Branch do? We are a deep linking and attribution tool for companies that care about growth and re-engagement. Um, so maybe you've heard of us before, maybe you're using us, but that's us. Hi everyone, my name is Jacques. Um, I've been working for tech startups now 10 years. Before it was all web, like pre-mobile, since over five years, um, helping mobile apps to grow. Worked for all sorts of uh, mobile apps, communication apps, lifestyle, mm, shopping apps, and lately uh, for classified app called mobile, basic, um, called uh, Wallapop, basically a mobile marketplace to sell and buy things secondhand. Hi, my name is Tamara Ziegler. Um, I'm the product manager of the Deutschland Card app. We are based in Munich. And to make it a little bit short, what is Deutschland Card? I think everyone of you knows Payback. We are the competitor of them. And um, yeah, I'm responsible there for the completely um, mobile marketing and additional to that also for the development of the app. Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is Waldo um, and my background is more in analytics. Um, so now since about a year and a half we've been working on the Lizara app, so Android and iOS. And um, yeah, one year and a half ago we um, started development and launched it four to six months thereafter. So in this past year, we've been working on optimizing it, building it further out. So Lazara, um, maybe you know it, it's an e-commerce company, about four years old, um, based here in Berlin. Um, yeah. Cool, thanks a lot. And yeah, let's just kick this off with, like the title says, how to delight or how to engage and delight app users. And I think everyone will agree, and we've heard this earlier a little bit that not the number one thing is to have an engaging and delightful product. And that's definitely the core and optimally everything would just grow organically and everyone would be super engaged. That's unfortunately most of the time not the case. And I want to start with you, Waldo, because you have more of a background in business analytics, did that at Zalando, at Viacom, and then you come to Lizara and you get tasked with, okay, launch these apps. Mm -hmm. you, you already have a successfully running um, web platform, you have a hybrid app out that's like semi-performing, and then you get the task, okay, put these apps out. So how do you go about doing that? Like, what do you look at? What KPIs did you look at uh, from the website maybe to transfer, to figure out which features go in the app and how did you then improve over time as someone who also has an analytical background but not really app experience too much? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, it was quite a switch indeed, um, although I had some, uh, a little bit of background in, in the app world, but very little. Um, I was lucky enough to start together with a very talented UX designer as well. So our approach has been uh, twofold in the sense that we work very user-centered and at the same time also very data-driven. Um, so I mean, when you talk about just the, the four to six months um, when between the moment we started and the moment we launched, um, that was very much MVP focused. So, okay, what key features are there that <coughs> users use? So, you know, um, you go into a product list, you want to be able to filter, you go to check out which payment options do you want there. Um, so, uh, very much MVP focused in that sense. Um, when we then launched, we started um, to be able to, to use those, uh, those metrics and the data that we've gathered. Um, and I think we worked on two main aspects. Uh, one is uh, the value creation and the other one is the value capturing. Um, and when you s look at, okay, what is value creation? Value creation are new features. Value capturing is, is, is more optimizing for uh, a local, um, yeah, optimizing for this local optimum. Um, and value creation, um, there we look at, okay, what do users really use? Um, what 
well, I mean, converting and, and, and loyal users, what do they, what are they really interested in? Um, and really focus on making those features more accessible, um, really focus on making those features also better. Um, so one example is, is, is filters. Um, I mean, this is a topic that is more recent, so that's why I have bring it up. Um, we see that about 16 to 25% of users who um, go on product lists actually filter. Um, and we saw there a bit of a mismatch between what we show on the home and then eventually going to product lists. So we switched a little bit the, um, yeah, the, the way that we lead users through the app. Um, and um, so based on data, we then look at, okay, what is the user path? How do users actually navigate through the app um, and optimize it for um, the really value-creating crea value features for the users um, or, or the key points in the user path? Um, and then, yeah, we also do, of course, do um, the um, value capturing uh, where we optimize for local uh, optimum. So for example, exit rates, we, monitor, we really monitor that. Um, we had an issue in onboarding uh, where we had about 15% drop off. So we, uh, we focused on that. And I, I think it's a balance between those two um, that will make your app better and, and, and being able to engage the users, like users are willing to, act, to, to engage with you because, oh, they see these features that they really want. And these, these, they, they feel like they're guided through in a way that um, delights them, let's say. What are the um, what are the K KPIs you guys look at? I mean, maybe uh, you can jump in. What are the things that like make or break your day? If you get in in the morning and look at it, you're like, shit, this went up, this went down, or great, this went up. What are those things that you should be looking at? Um, so I'll I'll speak on behalf of our our clients. So we work with a lot of um, pretty much every vertical from you know what companies like a Pinterest or Tinder to commerce companies, to um, travel like Airbnb or music like Amazon Music. And I'll try to speak on their behalf. And I think related to the problem that uh, Waldo was facing is like when you're just now beginning to make that investment in the app, one of the core things is like fundamentally from an organizational perspective, starting to shift the mindset of like a more complex and longer customer journey so oftentimes that might start on the desktop or mobile web, but end up in the app. And the way to capture that and prove the value of like, you know, certain cohorts is to, you, you need to look at more of a longer term perspective because like a customer journey by nature is gonna be a long term endeavor. And so segmenting out things like LTV by platform, able to say like, you know, the user that we took from mobile web from an organic search that then went on to install and then bought was much higher LTV than the one who, you know, stuck in mobile web, came from mobile search, and then, you know, wasn't able to purchase as frequently as the one in the app, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, so the, the common thing we see companies starting to do is align their objectives by platform and like thinking a little bit longer term than just an immediate like conversion rate or something like that. The same. <laughs> Yeah, I, can, um, I can't say something additional to that. It's for us the same. Um, of course, the retention rate, for us it's really important um, that the user not only install the app, he has to um, yeah, work with it. Um, we want to have a high monthly active user rate. This is really important, but addition to that, of course, the customer lifetime value. I find it interesting that all of you three over there uh, actually, also, Alex, I don't know if you guys are aware, but before Alex started this small company uh, called Branch, he was also an uh, app developer himself and uh, has sold an app uh, that was uh, where you could order photo books. So all of these guys actually work with apps where people have to go and buy a physical product. Like, or you have to use a voucher to go buy something, or you have to order something online, or you have to buy something off this classified um, app. And I was wondering, <laughs> How is that different in terms of engagement campaigns compared to working for uh, an app like a game or an app where you consume a lot of content where people typically want you to be using it all the time? You cannot really have the same goal because people just don't want to use your apps all the time every day. So how's the, what's the balance there? Maybe? I mean, um, one of the main differences between an e-commerce app and a classified app is um, that uh, the whole product is, has already, like uh, as a driver, um, Reengage is a reengagement uh, re product because you can actually sell stuff, so you can actually make money 
of it, you know. Um, whereas, I mean, users not only have the possibility to spend money, but they have also the possibility to, uh, to, to make money. And actually, we have, like, in other classified apps, we have really, like, power users that sell so much items every month that they make almost a living out of it or pay their rent with it, you know. So in terms of product, that's already, like, a big re-engagement driver that you can see in some uh, classified app, higher re-engagement rates, um, higher than average. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think the the biggest thing that I've observed in the difference of just like commerce versus more of the social, and we see it across the platform. If you look at like a, you know Zappos, uh, which sells shoes, uh, an Amazon company, like their objective is just to get you in the app, pick the shoe as fast as possible, and get you out of there with like the box on its way to your house. And you know, uh, comparatively working with like a Pinterest, it's like they just want you to sign up. So everything's you know, blocked by a sign-up wall or a registration wall, and then it's like as much personalization to just keep you stuck in the app as long as possible. I think that's really the, it's like direct response as fast as possible conversion to um, time spent is an important metric. Let's talk a little bit about um, push campaigns and app campaigns, because typically almost every app is um, using those, and I think if we're honest, no one really likes them as a user too much. I, for example, I just turned off push for CNN because they would send me, I swear, like 10 or 12 push notifications every day. And I'm just like, I'm not opening any of these. Like, don't you realize I'm not interested? And at some point, I'm just like, need to turn this off. And I sometimes have the feeling, and I mean, I'm an, I'm a, I'm an app person myself. I work in um, trying to get apps to grow. So I understand that it's necessary. Um, to do these campaigns, but you want to build smart campaigns. And I sometimes wonder if we're actually trying to just trick people into doing certain things while they are not really actually too engaged. They just want the voucher, and they just want the free something, and they just want to get their friends something for free. And I always have the feeling, okay, we're just tricking people, and they are not actually really into, into the product that much, and we're just trying to fake it up. Um, what do you think about that? For us, um, push notification is a really huge and big thing. Um, it's our yeah, main tool at the moment to get our users back into our app. Um, I think you have to be careful with push because I'm sure, of course, you can push every day to all of your users, but um, I can promise you your opt um, out rate will increase really high and um, this is not the goal of it. So. Um, you have, so my first 10 years, um, you have to segment your users. So um, be carefully and um, yeah, just have different segments, look on the age, look on the, f um, on is he female or f male and um, what's the interest, what is he doing in your app? And I have to say we are a little bit on the bright side of life at the Deutschland card because um, we are, um, have a lot of campaigns in our app with gaming stuff and so on. And so we have a really good thing, a really good content, uh, what we can um, tell our users. So um, for example, tomorrow we are starting with an advent, advent calendar and um, it's a really cool thing. So um, we can push us um, um, a push notification tomorrow to tell our users, hey, open the app. Um, we have an advent calendar, 24 days until Christmas. You can find some cool new coupons and um, you can win some cool stuff. And on the yeah, in the next weeks, we will send out every not every day, but um, every yeah, at the f fourth day, twelfth day, or whatever, we can send out some pushes. And um, yeah, our users love that because it's a little bit like a reminder, and it's not come on how you um, say that there's a sale or something like that. It's just um, yeah, see it maybe as a reminder, and then it works. Mm. How about you, Waldo? What yeah, I mean. Same, uh, share the same opinion. I mean, pushes are super important and they really drive up uh, engagement. Um, but of course, you shouldn't overuse it. And generally, we don't really get um, negative feedback regarding these pushes um, because I also think people know that they can disable it. Um, what we do get negative feedback on on our Google Play Store is uh, that users get too many emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I guess that's, uh, that's a shifting thing. Um, from email to, to push. Um, now, um, I was wanting to say something. Um, 
Yeah, so what we also are looking into is um, the changing um, a little bit our, our push offer um, because you have the option also to, to say, okay, let's differentiate a little bit between the different kinds of pushes because you have broadcast pushes and you have more transactional pushes. So we're looking into splitting that up so that users actually only get the transactional pushes related to, hey, your order is almost going to arrive or, um, you know, what about your card? We have now 10% off for that, like the more specific ones uh, versus broadcast, hey, you know, free shipping today. So uh, that might also um, improve the, the, the view of users on, on those campaigns um, by giving them more power over it. Um, I think it's an interesting uh, trend also with uh, the new Android O. Um, like you have automatically already, if you send the par right parameters, the, the option for users to disable, enable, however they feel like. So I think that's the direction that we're heading towards. I guess uh, what you're saying is <coughs> essential when setting up the CRM strategy to really define um, your app users into different user segments, you know, from the new users, high, low, active, less active, dormant, inactive, and so on. And then uh, what you're saying, like obviously there's different messaging, there's different uh, messaging with different wording, you know, per segment, but also within each segment you, you set up specific goals, what you want to achieve. No? Mm -hmm. And then obviously like active users might be happier or might be okay with receiving one push more, you know, and but of course we have to be more careful with users that are actually not so active. I feel like it's like, you know, when you get a push, if you think about the majority of pushes that you get today, it's all very personal stuff. Like it's a phone call or like a text message or something that's like very unique to you. And the pushes and the tests that we've run and just what things we've seen is like the cohort of one of just like a single user getting something that's very personalized is so much more effective and, you know, high returning than a um, like some general broadcast. So like something we built for our commerce app before was we had a two-sided referral thing, um, use branch for it. And when the user shared the link, then another user joined, it would be like, you get a credit when the person goes on and takes some action, that referred user. And getting a notification of like, hey, you're so influential that you like cause somebody to do some new action is like a really rewarding thing as a user. And that push had such a high return compared to some of the general like holiday campaign generic pushes that we had, which would drive far more uninstalls than, um, you know, the personalized stuff, so. Yeah, I think it's very much making the user feel special and um, making it very personal, which also requires more resources, right? I mean, you have to put in some time to figure out how, which push works and which content works exactly. And that's not something that every company can do. So a lot of companies, they just like run some tests, figure out what works okay, and then just let that run because they don't have enough resources. Um, is there a way of, without having to invest too many resources, still managing to actually figure out what that good content is and figure out um, which, which campaign sh campaigns actually work super well without having to have someone on this full time? which a bigger company definitely can afford, but small companies can't. Does anyone have experience like, do you guys all manage all of that yourselves? Or do you have like a team that helps you? Or how do you go about um, working with like engagement campaigns inside your companies? Um, I mean, we do our uh, push campaigns ourselves um, through a third party platform um, that's firmly integrated um, with us. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it demands a lot of time and I'm sure um, there could be, I mean, we can always do more and, and it would be good, but like I mean, we, we go through A-B testing and, and optimize um, and, and then combined with also more like technical implementation, like, okay, like personalized pushes are great, but they're not that easy to implement. Um, so, I mean, that's also the part where we're then saying, okay, let, you know, we're working on that technically. Um, but that's definitely, like you said, like it's definitely the, the way forward to, to be ever more personal, even like the single product. Um, and uh, we're going in that direction, but yeah, do not you, completely there. Do you guys run retargeting campaigns on top of that? Because I was wondering, I had a discussion with you earlier about this. I know you know a little bit in this, in this area. It's like, okay, you run a lot of engagement campaigns, you, you send out push notifications, and then at the same time you target um, 
potentially the same people with retargeting campaigns on like Facebook or wherever, whatever you use. Um, how do you make the connection between those two? Because it could be that you sent me already five push notifications, I didn't open them, I saw them, didn't open them, and then the sixth one that I see is a retargeting campaign and I open it straight away, which pushes up my uh, success rate. Um, for that campaign, but my push campaign might have not been successful. How do you, do you guys work with that? Do you have a solution for that? Um, how do you transfer that? Maybe before we get to you, maybe someone else also has an idea. I, th I think you um, have to split it a little bit. So maybe um, you have a segment with users who opt out your app and um, you take a list from these users and you can yeah, upload it on Facebook, AdWords or on any other agency and um, start with a really, really good re-engagement campaign of um, display marketing or something like that. So you can um, yeah, get this users um, with display campaigns and the other ones um, with the push. But sometimes you have to combine it because yeah, maybe you're, you don't like pushes, so you swipe it away all the time. And when you see that, that the, this part of this, um, the users of this segment don't um, yeah, open any time, any pushes, then maybe you have to um, yeah, split this segment again and then um, give them some yeah, display marketing or something like that. Yeah, bear in mind that um, in general, 50% or more of your users have the pushes uh, disabled, you know, so you're not going to reach them with push notifications. And then on the other hand, unfortunately, the majority of all our app users are rather inactive users than active, so you're not going to reach those guys with in-app messages either. So I think that's actually where retargeting ads come in, you know, to exactly cover that, that like um, percentage of users you're not going to reach with. Yeah. Oh, one, one thing that I think is, um, it's happened it, like pretty much just with mobile, but for it's the first time ever with like the development of a new platform, it didn't happen in the web, but it's happened now with mobile, where marketing and product basically have to work together as a team to come up with a consistent message that aligns with, you know, the actual product functionality and features. Like, even just push alone, where does that live? Is that in the product organization? Is that in the messaging? Like, transactional might live in product, but, you know, then marketing might be pushing out generic blasts, and you get this, like, huge conflicts. And unless you can really bring the entire team together and, you know, think about it holistically as a platform of, like, how is marketing going to touch right in conjunction with product it makes it incredibly hard to you know figure out some of those things like attributing back to the multiple campaigns that were pushed transactionally versus the retargeting campaign that was run in a completely different part of the organization and so um, I think it's like the onset of growth as a role is an attempt to solve that particular problem of somebody that can oversee both you know marketing and product to connect them both together fix some of the problems of the silos from a user experience perspective, but also attribution, so. I constantly fight with, uh, not fight, like friendly fight, with uh, our UX people because they love this product. I love the product too, but I also want to hit the KPIs. And I'm more like, okay, let's hit those KPIs. And they're more like, oh, this product is so beautiful and everyone's going to find everything on their own, which is not true, unfortunately. So I constantly get into this with them, like why it makes sense and um, why we're doing this. And obviously, um, product people, UX people, most likely want everyone to find everything organically, which just typically doesn't happen. I don't know if you have these issues um, yourselves or how you just um, come to, to a common decision together, um, what, which campaigns make sense without crowding the product too much with unnecessary content. Um, I mean, uh, we work very, very closely together with marketing. I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, uh, um, you need a mix between those two to know what is actually priority um, and, and what will generate value. Um, and, um, but we don't really have the clash between UX and, and marketing, to be honest. Um, Lucky you. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. Um, I mean, UX wants a, a great user experience and, and marketing in many ways can help with that. Um, landing uh, the, the deep link at the right place, for example. Um, what kind of, okay, if we want to send a coupon, okay, how do we want to do that? Like, w they get a coupon, does it automatically get copied and then where does it land to? Um, and that's a super exciting uh, project. Um, and we take it on as such. Um, and we try to make it a good user experience. 
Um, so yeah, I I think we have. A, I, d I don't. I never really had this kind of clash between marketing and UX, but I don't know. Maybe there is something there. Um, we see it with bigger traditional organizations that haven't quite fully bought into mobile. Maybe they hired like an app dev team and they like live in a separate office and nobody talks to them. They're just like working on the app, which is like the worst possible thing you could ever do. Um, but a lot of the new startups, I think, are a lot better about doing it. And some people a little bit more mobile first, I think, are better about combining them. I mean, we are often the ones that, that also like say like, hey, marketing, why don't we change the pictures here? Or like, why don't we do that? Maybe we can increase engagement this or this way. Um, and I think that that's really beautiful. It, oh, if you can, um, if it's a two-way street uh, where marketing talks to product, hey, this is really important for us. And, and, and product says, hey, what about this opportunity? Um, the same way that UX talks to development. I want to talk a little bit also about referral programs, and we have someone here who knows a thing or two about that, because you guys say yourself, you help companies build great referral programs, which sounds amazing, but at what stage in, a, in an app's life does it actually make sense to set up a referral program? What if I'm like brand new, I have no, no one knows me, there's no awareness, does it make sense already to set something up, and how do you best go about it? What are like success factors in there? Uh, I, sure, I'll yeah. So uh, well, the way we think about the like viral loop is starts on acquisition, next is activation, next is conversion, fourth is the like referral. So by if you think about it that way, then of course the referral feeds back around as part of a you know um, acquisition channel. But if you think about it that way, like by nature of the you know, funnel, you can't necessarily refer, get people referring until you've got them converting first. So we usually see it as a secondary thing after you've got some folks that are engaged and ready to like start using their conversion event perhaps as a way to drive a referral. Do you guys use referral programs in your apps at all? We have it on the website. Um, but to be honest, um, yeah, at the moment it's not uh, a priority. Um, and when you look at the market, it's also more, in, but in fashion, more something for luxury brands, generally. Um, where people will say, hey, look, uh, I bought this or this, or... Um, <laughs> might not be, um, but at this stage, it, in, t in terms of value creation, uh, it's rather low on the priority roadmap. How about you others? No referral? Not, not yet? Not really, no. Thought about it, but... Um do you have some arguments, of Alex, of why they should definitely have one? Well, it's, I think it's really hard, and I think it's, it's really hit or miss is the biggest problem. So people have variable, you know, you, you talk to one person, they'll say it was the biggest waste of time ever, and others will be like, we wouldn't be here without it. And, um, you know, well, as an example, um, we worked with a popular dating app that uh, basically built their entire acquisition strategy around referrals, where in order to get access, you, you know, it was kind of a wait list and you could move up the wait list if you referred a friend to join the wait list and, you know, that type of thing. So end up driving like a majority of all their new traffic. But then I've seen others where, you know, in the hamburger menu, they put like a refer a friend thing among six other options and it drives like two to three percent of their new installs. And of course, that's a disaster. Um, and so I think the like the challenge in implementing a referral is really thinking about exactly how does it fit within your overall product. And there isn't like one, I can't just be like, you just got to do this one thing and it's going to be a success because it's going to be very dependent on the nature of your user journey, when you can capture that moment, when they're most likely to drive a referral, that emotional moment where they want to share, like, um, you know, when they're proud of this super expensive thing they bought or whatever it is. Uh, and so it's really up to you to do it. But if you do it right, it can be um, a game-changing, you know, uh, feature because it's like now when you acquire a user through any other channel, you have the potential of actually acquiring additional users, bringing down the total cost of acquisition for that first user. Um, and so it, it just it completely changes the way you think about acquisition when you have a successful program. So we have a couple more minutes. If there are any audience questions, I'm happy to take those. Raise your hand now or scream or something. Okay, otherwise, I can also just ask a few more things, no problem. Um, what, I, what annoys me a little bit about referral programs is when someone 
gives examples of great programs. It's typically uh, Dropbox and PayPal and Uber. That's always like the big ones that were so successful and grew the app so much uh, through those programs. But those apps also, they basically gave, gave away free money. And that's e quite easy. Sorry, no offense to any of those companies, but if you can give away free money to people, this typically would work. But I, for example, worked for a company previously to this one where we were in a growth stage, so we weren't monetizing at all. At all. We didn't have anything to give away, really. We still tried people to get into like sharing this app, but it makes it just much more difficult if you don't have anything to give to them, not really, unless you buy something or, or buy some vouchers or put some vouchers in there. What do you recommend to companies like that? Or maybe you also have experience uh, with that. Um, yeah, sure. So the... Um, I think like we think of referrals the same as sharing because they're basically the same thing like if there is some really fantastic content or something that is worth sharing like travel is a good one that where there is a really great content with pictures and it's by nature a group effort and so there's a really nice artifact of sharing that's not incentivized it's just like part of the product um, whereas like with the photo book app we had people invested a lot of time building these really beautiful books and basically created user-generated content. And right at the moment, right after they paid us money, capturing that as like, share this with your best friend, this like beautiful book. Um, I think it, we ended up with like 30 to 40% of purchases ended up sharing with a friend that drove like a click, um, which was pretty effective. And so I don't think you need to necessarily like throw money at it if you can figure out how to just like, as I said before, capture that moment and like when the user has the most amount of love or hate or some like, you know, deep emotion for your product that makes them want to tell somebody else. Mm. I mean, in, in, in our app, uh, the when users can share products, they can share their card and purchase, whatever. But uh, to be honest, that's relatively low mm -hmm. um, and we see a higher sharing ratio on, on other third party platforms like Facebook, Instagram and all that, um, which then in turn of course shows that there is a, a potential there in integrating that in the app mm -hmm. again. Um, and there's some great examples out there of uh, feeds, uh, etc. Um, but yeah. Social shares is just a good example of what you mentioned before, uh, marketing working together with a product. I remember we also had like the share buttons, the social share buttons in one point of the product page, which um, they were not really, well, I mean, like they could not, we could not find them easily, you know, and then we <laughs> obviously we tried to increase uh, the, the conversions when it came to share, we changed them together with the um, UX team, you know, with the, uh, with the design team, and uh, yeah, it all, all the percentages went up, you know, we had more organic um, users, K factor um, changed, you know, positively, mm -hmm. so. We, we also see a lot of success, and it's kind of similar to referrals, but a little bit bigger scale on the influencer side. So identifying somebody who maybe even has used your product before that has you know a lot of followers on Instagram or whatever, um, and then giving them some sort of promotional link where you know it's probably you have to pay them a little bit of money, but having them you know using them to effectively drive uh, traffic and you know attributing it and tracking it back to them is important too. Um, but that's worked really, really well for a lot of the companies we work with. Yeah, I think this uh, this topic is also something that we could spend so much more time um, talking about. I guess we're going to have to leave that for another time in another panel because we are actually out of time and I'm getting a red blinking <laughs> signal up there. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Thanks for listening. Yeah.